Assembly Women Troy Singleton. One of the great mysteries of American lexicon is what is a hero. Too often when you think about it in the terms of sports, we see multi-million dollar athletes that are coined the phrase hero. When we think about today's movie actors and those we see on the screen, we're quick to make the latest action star as a hero. But what if the definition of hero is something more, something deeper? Heroes are individuals who do a lot of ordinary things extraordinarily well under difficult circumstances. You're about to hear the story of such an individual, an American hero and a patriot, and my friend, Bob Yancey. Since World War II, Bob Yancey has stood up for his country and defended the ideals of the American way, unabashedly and unequivocally standing up in the face of danger. I'm proud to be one of his mentees, not by any word that Bob has ever given to me, but by his example of shining diligence, patriotism, and what it means to be a true hero. I welcome you to the story of my friend, Bob Yancey. They, they gave me all kind of work because I never lost a patient. I got every last one of them out of there. They, and, and I never forget how them guys looked at me. Hello, I'm Mike Panarello with the Armed Forces Heritage House Museum. I'm here to interview a, a very, very honorable man, a great guy. Um, he's also a veteran of three wars. Um, Mr. Yancey, there's so much about you that we need to talk about and need to cover. And um, first of all, I say that fighting in three wars, I mean, does that, how does that has affected you over the years, being a veteran of three wars? Right in a way, that's an accomplishment. Yes, you uh, The fact remained is that uh, I had no choice. I just came up in that era of time where I just fell right in the place and uh, I, de I dealt with it and uh, thank God I survived. Right. Now we're going to, we, we were going to um, talk about, I know you started with the Navy and then you switched over to the Army, which I'd like to talk about, but now how old were you when world when you entered World War II, how old? 18 you? years of age. 18 years of age. And originally you went into the Navy, what was your MOS with the Navy? Cook. Well, at that time, uh, and I'm uh, an African American, and the Navy could only be a, a cook or a steward. I think it's most obvious as to what I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, you had a combat readiness position. When what was that? And how did you end up? You ended up manning a deck gun, an aircraft gun. Well, first of all, I, when I was drafted in the Navy, it was so hard up for a minute at that time. I never went to boot camp. I got all my training aboard ship. Uh, at a battle station, uh, they sent me down, they put me down in the hole, uh, passing up ammo. I was on a submarine chaser, mm -hmm. 175 feet long and 25 feet wide. I had a 3 inch 50 uh, gun on the forecastle. Mm -hmm. He said, Where do you want to be? I said, Any aircraft gun number one. He said, You don't know anything about that gun. I said, I'm not stupid. <laughs> I learned like anybody else. He said, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to have a, a target practice uh, for three days and then a couple of days uh, before the invasion of Leyte in the Philippines. Right. But he said, if you get that target, he says, you can uh, have that gun. I said, fair enough. And lo and behold, they brought this uh, Piper plane in, uh, pulled in the cable, a uh, 350-foot cable. And the objective is when the plane uh, gets midship, the hollow commence firing, so you'd be firing at the target. When the target gets midship, the hollow cease firing. But I didn't hear him, I kept on firing. I think another plane is doing like this, trying to get out of my way. Right. So finally they got me stopped, and uh, the skipper said, uh, Yancey, he said, you didn't get the target. He said, but you tried so doggone hard. We're going to give you that gun so you can get a Japanese plane instead of trying to knock one of ours out this guy. <laughs> and so you, that's you end up getting a Japanese plane. How did that happen? What occurred there? Well, you know, uh, during the invasion of uh, Leyte, they are having an abundance of Japanese planes. Uh, all, I, all you could see in the sky was a lot of dogfights. Right. 
uh, with the uh, American planes and the Japanese planes. And uh, lo and behold, the, the Japs really got uh, uh, smart and they start to coming in at lower after lower the mass of the ships. When they come in to lower the mass of the ship, they knew right well you couldn't fire because you fired your own ships. You had to wait till they pull up. Right. And when they pull up, they knew it was all over. Right. Because every hey, there's uh, 800, 900 ships out there. Right. Uh, in a way, there's no escape. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, that's the way it went down. They, uh, that's how come they uh, lost so many planes. Now, was this before the kamikazes entered in? Or was it the kamikaze planes came later? No, they came at that time. At that time? Yes. So the plane that you were shooting at was making a strafing run or a bombing run? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. And they make suicide dives uh -huh. on the ships and so forth. Uh, and uh, when they make those suicide dives, you know, they they try to hit the turrets of the ship, mm -hmm. therefore knocking their guns out of position. Right. Uh, you see bodies flying in the air and everything else flying in the air mm -hmm. when they make them suicide dives. Okay, now you're 18 years old, you're manning a deck gun, there's kamikazes, there's, you know, Japanese planes all over the place. You know, what's gone through your mind? Jeez. Survival of the fittest. How do I how do I survive this here? And that's a that's where you make contact with the man time. upstairs. World War Two ends. Where were you when the war was over? I was in the uh, the China Sea uh -huh. uh, with uh, 1945. Mm -hmm. It was right after the invasion of uh, Okinawa. Right. At that time, we had what they call a, a, had a typhoon. Right. Yeah. I heard and, about that. Yeah, and three ships capsized. Mm -hmm. with three destroyers. Uh, we were tied to the lifelines and throwing heaving lines over to try to get the guys out of the water. Uh -huh. uh, the heaving lines are 100 feet long. Mm -hmm. uh, the waves are carry us 50, 60 feet up in the air. Right. And the guy, you'd be down there in what we call the swall. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd be so far down there, you'd have missed him 100 feet. I, I imagine that was just the scariest combat. Oh, by sure. Mm -hmm. Because the, the waves will wash, will wash over if you. If you weren't tied to the lifeline, you'd be gone. Now, war's over from 45 to 50. Were you in the Army or the Navy? 45 to 50. I, I made the transition in 1950. Uh, why did you, after so many years in the Navy, decide to join the Army? As I always say, I couldn't drink all that water. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, to answer your question, uh, I was, uh, after the war was over, uh, you, got, you got points, uh, who went home and who didn't. Right. I mean, and the points consist of, you know, are you married, how many battles you've been in, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so uh, I was at the bottom of the totem pole. So I said, well, maybe I stand for two years. Mm -hmm. So I joined the reserve. And uh, in 1950, uh, I was going to school in Philadelphia, uh, Institute of Criminology because I was a policeman at night time right. and a student in a day mm -hmm. under the GI Bill. Gotcha. So when the war broke out in September of 1950, the Navy sent me a notice and said the next notice you receive, you had 24 hours of readiness. So I said, <laughs> you know, my experience in the Navy, I, I can't drink all that water. Let me get on the ground. <laughs> so I, I joined the Army. Right. And wow. because I was a veteran of World War II, Right. I only had to take six weeks of refreshment training. Yeah, right. So they sent me to Fort Dix, and uh, I got to Fort Dix, they sent me out on uh, Range Road, never forget it, which was completely surrogated right. uh, at that time. So all the African Americans stayed out on Range Road. Mm -hmm. uh, you might not be caught up on main post after dark. And that was basically because you're African American? Yes, correct? definitely. But, but white? were allowed to have the freedom of the post, but not Oh, yeah. Them. Not only white, but prisoners were. Oh, that's interesting. Prisoners were. And, and uh, but we, we couldn't. Now that, but that, you see, there's a, you, you know, I, I never fed into that. Right. Because, uh, you know, I, my, my philosophy has always been that uh, positive thinking brings positive results. Right. So you don't feed into negativity. And, so, so, and I've seen so many African Americans that fed into it and were destroyed in the process. I see. Uh -huh. Now, uh, getting up into Korea, uh, the war starts in June of 1950, and uh, you took, you did not take place in the defense around 
the Pusan perimeter, but you did take place in the invasion of Incheon. Yeah. So pick up your military record from uh, Incheon, which would have been September of 50 on. In that particular time, they had what they call repo depots. Mm -hmm. That's where soldiers are in transit. Right. To the to their from one point to another point in order to join a unit. Right. So I went over on a, uh, on a ship, and when I got there, they uh, they sent me to this repo depot. Mm -hmm. uh, so the colonel saw the stripes on my arm. He called me over there and he says, "You take your first 500 guys over there and uh, get the cosmoline off of their weapons." and uh, get back to me and I'll tell you what your perimeter is to cover for the night. Right. So I said, well, where's the front line at? He said, right here. Mm -hmm. I said, I'll be there. Now, you were with the so 24th, 20, at that time, the 24th Infantry was all colored at that time. Well, yeah, all black units with white officers. Right. They started to integrate slightly. A couple of companies had black officers, mm -hmm. but all of them was line officers, what they call line officers, below yeah. the rank of colonel. Right. Okay, or rather, I should say, below the rank of major. And then you push north. Did you see a lot of combat then? Oh yes, Did, we lost a lot of men. Uh, At that lost. time, you're fighting the North Koreans. Right, right. Explain the combat there and what it was. What you were well, you know about. what we had. We we had what they call skirmishes. Right, skirmishes. Yeah, and uh, you you fight it and take a hill, and then uh, you move on. Right. And, uh, to maybe four or five scrimmages before you get to your destination. Well, that was, uh, they put me in a, a, what they called S2, Infantry Intelligence. Right. So I had to, I had to make what they called uh, contact patrols. Mm -hmm. I carried nine men and two interpreters. Right. And I would uh, infiltrate the line and find out the strength of the enemy. Right. And then uh, and try to avoid my exposure mm -hmm. or shots or shooting or anything and, and get out of there. Right. And report my findings. Uh, so the battalion and the uh, upper echelon uh, know what they're in, in, confronted with. Correct. So a lot of men, you, we lost them uh, through uh, hand grenades and, mm -hmm. and, and booby traps mm -hmm. and so forth, because uh, they were they were known to booby trap the areas. Right. Uh, the way the, to make a long story short, we had the North Korean beat. And we got up to the Yellow River, Yellow River. Uh, at what they call Kunari, mm -hmm. and uh, the first calf was up there. Said, "Man, we ain't fired a shot in three days." Said, "Man, well, we got it made." Hey, and uh, you thought you were gonna be home by Christmas? Right? Yeah, right. So then, uh, all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. Chinese entered the war. 350,000 Chinese come across the Yellow River. Now the Chinese came across that border like, like a plague. Now, just for the listening audience, from September until November, then you're pushing the North Koreans up. Right. And then this is under the orders of General MacArthur. Right. Now, later on, with high history being hindsight, 2020, many people felt he should not have pushed up there. Right. But at that time, you are just a soldier pilot. Yeah, definitely. You were. Hey. You know, your whole concept basically was survival of the fittest. Right. You know, hey, you weren't into that political play. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. <clears throat> um, November of 1950, the Chinese entered the war. How did the war change for you then? Well, that's when the Chinese came across the border. Right. And they came over like a plague. Mm -hmm. They completely surrounded us. Right. And uh, that's when the, the captain, uh, the CO, instructed us to uh, break it up into small groups right. to infiltrate the line mm -hmm. and to join friendly forces. Right. And that's what we did. Mm -hmm. And uh, my group was very fortunate. We got out of there. Did you see human wave attacks? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, with the bayonets out? and... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and hand grenades flying in the air, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, there was actually physical contact. There was no. Uh, they were that close. Hell yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. In, in talking to other Korean War veterans, that's what they say. 
that part was very, very like it was crazy. Oh yeah, yeah. Three hundred thousand, they were on you and things like right. that. Right, and uh, you know, the, and, and the fact is, these guys are little guys. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and and it was cold. Right. That's it, it. It was thirty to forty wow. below zero. Good. Yeah. Good. Now we were talking about Korea, and the Chinese came in. We we're talking about how cold it was. And at that point, um, what caused the desegregation of the United States Army at that time? Well, it was under uh, President Truman executive order in 9981, mm -hmm. uh, complete desegregation in the service when all units had to be integrated. Mm -hmm. And at that time, uh, I was in the 24th Infantry Regiment, 25th Division, uh, known as the Buffalo Soldiers. And the Buffalo Soldiers was from 1866 up into 1951, when they was uh, under President Truman executive order there. And then when they deactivated them in uh, September, uh, in 1951, they brought in the, the 14th Infantry that was integrated. Mm -hmm. And that's when they, they sent me home. By that time, I had 18 months in, in Korea. I was ready to go. Uh, Vietnam, uh, which is basically 15, 20 years after your uh, being in Korea, how did the military change for an African American in between Korea and Vietnam? Well, the change, the change started taking place under the President Truman Executive Order. Mm -hmm. uh, however, a lot of units in the South uh, uh, didn't want to comply. Mm -hmm. So what the, the, the Department of the Army said, well, if it's off limits to, to blacks, it's off limits to whites. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it became an economical problem. Mm -hmm. the cash registers weren't ringing up. So they said, hey, come on in. Uh, you were retrained, and in Vietnam you were a combat medic? Yes, because I got the, uh, I got frostbites and everything from the, the, from the Korean War, mm -hmm. and therefore I couldn't stay in uh, what they call a picket fence. Mm -hmm. I wasn't total uh, physical uh, with all wants. So they sent me down to uh, uh, Fort San Houston, Texas, and I was a senior non-commissioned officer, so I was E7, so uh, I had to go for two years for training. And then I wound up as an instructor down there for three years. Now, you were talking about something prior to about the uh, Martin Luther King pointing out an obvious fact that has bothered many people over the years. The well, yeah, part. because while he was talking about the uh, Martin Luther King said that the uh, American population consists of 12% uh, of African Americans. But yet there were 34 percent was dying in Vietnam. Well, this created a, a great a, a problem because uh, people started rioting and so forth. And in Saigon, they had a, a lot of African American in the stockade there. In fact, when they used to come, they, they come out to my training, out to my dispensary for treatment. I, I, I had to I had to wear two guns. But I tell them, hey, I run this place. Hey, you don't come in here and raid all that hell. Because a lot of them be on, on, a lot of guys was on drugs and so forth, right. coming out of the field. Mm -hmm. Hey, and, uh, you know, he, he's not taking over this. Right. I tell them, well, number one, you're a soldier. Act like one. Mm -hmm. Hey, act like a damn soldier. That's what you're trained for. Mm -hmm. And don't come in here like if he, he want my treatment. Yeah. I ran a medical facility. Right. I had 12 doctors and 85 technicians. So you, hey, so I'm not going to tolerate it. Now, Vietnam, and we were talking about how the Vietnam veteran came back, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the healing of the Vietnam veteran, and to now to the point where uh, many children and students, they have, uh, many kids have a hard time understanding why Vietnam veterans were treated badly. Well, now, the, the, and the reason being is because, you know, uh, we're trained differently. Okay, we we love kids. Right. Uh, I don't care what nationality they are. You try to help them. They're in Vietnam, you're giving uh, you're giving the kids some candy out of your rations, and and cookies and all out of your ration here, and here's another little kid in the back. They're trying to put a hand grenade in your gas tank. Mm -hmm. You know, a kid will only do what an adult tell them to do. You can't blame that kid. But you know, yeah, hey, you know yourself that hey, I, I got to survive. I got to go home. I got a family. You see what I'm saying? So a kid get messed up in the process, all because the adults are forcing him to do something that he knows right is not for him to do.
Yeah. And that's the reason why, through that misunderstanding, is the reason why they come home and say, well, hey, he's a baby killer. Uh, he, he said he killed kids and all. And all because they put the kids out front. Um, Vietnam uh, is over, and basically you then came back. Uh, when did you separate from the service? I retired in 1971. And then what did you do? Well, I went back to, went back to college again. Mm -hmm. In fact, I started right here, PCC. Right. right. And if you uh, look at the Hall of Fame, uh, from the Illumina Hall of Fame, you see my name, second name. <laughs> and what job did you take? What peacetime jobs did you take? I was a, a teacher in the Department of Corrections. I retired as a principal of the school principal. Now, you're involved in a lot of organizations with a lot of positive uh, programs that you've been involved in. So let's just talk about some of the things that you've been involved in in your post-military experience. Well, no, I became a, a veteran advocate because I, I knew what a veteran went through. Mm -hmm. I knew the price that he paid, and I thought he should have the best of everything. And I wanted to make sure he did. He had that. And I fought for, I went before the legislators, fight for uh, veteran benefits, I organized in the Burlington County the uh, uh, Burlington County uh, uh, Alliance, mm -hmm. and my objective was to bring all the veterans' organization under one umbrella for legislative purposes only. Mm -hmm. And in the process of doing so, I achieved uh, we achieved a lot, I should say. Uh, number one, all those who have 100% disability. Uh, don't pay any property taxes in the, in, in the state of New Jersey. That was a good victory. Uh, yeah, I, I carried the guy before the legislators. I filled up the, the what's the name? What do you call it? The, the arena on well, top of the legislators. Mm -hmm. uh, I filled it up with all you could see up there with veterans caps. You know, hey, uh, and you got a unanimous, a unanimous vote. Now you're on Operation Standby, which is a very good humanitarian effort. What is Operation Standby? Well, uh, no, stand down. Stand down. Correct. Uh, stand down is for the homeless veterans. Right. Uh, unfortunately, there's too many uh, veterans that uh, have a tendency to, to feel that uh, alcohol or drugs will alleviate their problem. Right. Which, which doesn't. It creates their problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought we should do everything we can to uh, try to get them back to the fold. Right. And realize that. Uh, those who are helping them went through the same thing that they went through. And uh, you have to maintain an open mind and try to, uh, you know, help yourself to, when other people are trying to help you. And it, this is the, the philosophy that we, we use. And uh, to, I would venture to say, I think the last statistics were that uh, two out of six people that you see are homeless or veterans. So what, what accounts for that? Do you think it was the drugs and alcohol and the problems of dealing with the post-wartime situations? Well, you know, uh, uh, we just learned about the post-traumatic stress. You know, uh, when I was in World War II, they say we were shot out. <laughs> That's the only term they had for it. Now, I, I served with BVAC with you, Burlington County Veterans Advisory Council, we, we work with the freeholders. Um, what are some other things that you've done over the years that you're proud of? Well, I had the opportunity to go back to Germany. I go back to a career in uh, 2001 with uh, Chris Todd Whitman uh, on her uh, economical uh, uh, trip to Asia. And how did the Korean people treat you as a person who fought in their defense? Oh, my God, like I was a king. Unbelievable. Uh -huh. And then, and then uh, I, when I step off the bus in, uh, in Seoul, this colonel walks up and he says, who's Sergeant Yancey? And Colonel Warner was in charge of our group. He says, here he is right here. And the colonel says, my father was your platoon leader in 1950. Wow. He says, and he told me to take good care of you. I said, I'll be a dirty bird. <laughs> Which is very interesting because if we look at the wars that were fought in America, the term the Forgotten War is usually pertained to in Korea. Korea. But you go to Korea 
and they are ama- they're, they're like amazing with the affection that they show the people who defended their country. They, uh, you know, I think they're more grateful and appreciative than some uh, a lot of Americans, uh, in virtue of the fact that they they constantly look from where they came from to where they're at, which shows them had it not been for the Americans, they wouldn't be there. And uh, this, this is overwhelming. And uh, they, like I met two, the two uh, Medal of Honor winners of uh, South Korean soldiers. Uh, they took me and uh, they, they kept me for three or four days. And uh, I just partied. I thought I was on another planet, you know. I, <laughs> but it was beautiful. But they, they're very appreciative. If you were giving a message now, I, I guess I would I ask this in different ways. And you look back on your life and your career, and you look back, and we'll focus on African American children. And what would you say to them? What would you would be any advice or anything that you would like them to know? What would you say to young African? They're looking for role models, and we do have uh, an absence, so to speak, of many role models in the African American community. What well, would you say? Because I would look at you as a role model. Well, what I what I used to teach, in, 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 especially in a correctional system, that number one, each of us are responsible for what we make of ourselves. You can't blame other people for your failures. You can't help people that are not willing to help themselves. And you only get out of life what you put into it. You don't put anything in, you don't get anything out. It's just that simple. And that you have to get rid of that slave mentality that somebody else is going to take care of me. You take care of yourself. What about um, family? And yeah, I have, I have uh, three girls and two boys. Uh, I was married for uh, 57 years. My wife passed away in 2008. And... Uh, I had no problem with them. Uh, in fact, my grand and nor my grandkids. Uh, mm-hmm. My uh, my oldest grandson is a. He just I think he's going to retire this year. He got 25 years at a in the state police. He's a lieutenant. I mean, a captain in a, in the state police. Did any of your children uh, or a grand or a grandchildren follow your example in from the military? Yeah. No, no, they didn't want no part of it. <laughs> <laughs> And I didn't blame him. Uh, <laughs> uh, one, to, uh, you know, you seek his own. You understand? You you, you don't push yourself on uh, or your beliefs on any on anybody. Let them make the choice. Uh, my oldest son, he uh, he won a thirty-five thousand dollars scholarship at, uh, at a, in high school. He came and went to General Motors, Flint, Michigan. He became a draft engineer. In fact, he just uh, he was a CEO of. Technology, and he just retired last year. Uh, he's 55. I asked him what he's going to do the rest of his life. He said, "Play golf." <laughs> now, if I I'd like yes. to revisit World War II for a second, and um, I'd like you to kind of elaborate on World War II. You were talking a little bit about the role of women. Yes, you know, in our in our society, prior to World War II, the women looked at the men for security and for everything. World War II came, and believe me when I tell you uh, that all the young people in every community that exists was drafted. The women taken over where the men were missing or absent. They went into the plants. They, they start making tanks. They're not making refrigerators no more. They're not making toasters. They're making jeeps. They're making airplanes, etc. So it revolutionized our whole society. And I think it's good for the women because they have a lot more independency than they ever had before. Now, if there's one memory of combat in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, a combat memory, can you explain it's going to stay with you forever and why? Can you explain in detail? Uh, I think it when I was in uh, Vietnam and I had to go to five miles down the road 
to this uh, on, on uh, to the ammunition depot. It blew up, and I could hear the yelling and the hollering and so forth. And when I pulled in there, the colonel says to me, "How did you make it?" I said, "I don't know, sir, but we're here." The colonel said, "I want you to sit up in that Quonson hut over there." I said, "I'm going to sit up in that Quonson hut. I got to go underground." A half hour later, where he told me to sit up, blue sky high. But my job is always to take care of the patient, and make sure he's in a secure place. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you buy by your training and so forth, hey, and I told I had, I, I had to get some guys back down the road, and uh, I put them on a on a three quarter ton truck, and I shot them with morphine and, 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 and put tourniquets on them and so forth. And I had, uh, uh, the colonel said, you can't go back down that road. I said, sir, I'm a senior medic here. I assume all responsibility. I didn't know the chaplain was there. The chaplain leaned over my shoulder and he said, you're doing a hell of a job. Right. Don't let nobody stop you. I told the guy, get the hell down the road like I told you. Right. Hey, so anyway, to make a long story short, uh, they, they gave me all kind of work because I never lost a patient. I got every last one of them out of there. Hey, and uh, I never forget how them guys look at me, you know, uh, you know, hey. How was that to see an American soldier wounded? I mean, I'm sure you've seen a lot. Oh, yeah. What was that like, seeing those kids, those kids, yeah, all torn up, and you coming up to help them? What was that like? I, I, I felt dynamic. I felt that, that you know, I had that power uh, to alleviate their pain, uh, to, to get them to settle down and to assure them you got it made. Right. You understand me? You're going home, we're going to still be here. Right. You know, and you're trying to inspire them to, uh, to, to change their thinking and not to, to think it's all over. Right. It's just the beginning. You, you understand what I'm right. saying? In talking about race relations and promotions in American military, would you like mm -hmm. to comment on that? Yes, uh, and I'm going to comment with relation to my own experiences. Right. So many was caught up in the same situation. I remember staying in grade 15 years before I could get promotion. And yet I was operating way above my grade. I could do the job, but I couldn't get paid. And I couldn't get promoted, which uh, upset me. But I, and no matter how I fought to overcome it and I get uh, people to understand uh, you know, it was a battle because uh, some would accept, some would reject. You, under, you understand me? And we'll come up with uh, lame stories that. Uh, <laughs> so you're saying, by contrast, a white person, a white sailor or right. soldier, would have had advancement many times over, and because oh. of you being oh, African American. Yeah, sure. I've seen guys that uh, I've seen guys that were, were goofing up in the outfit, and the only way they could get rid of them was a promoter. Said you gotta be good for me. <laughs> and again, Mr. Yancey, I know we've. How did this make you feel? Well, hey, I, I felt real bad. I felt that uh, unequality, mm -hmm. uh, and I felt the the uh, the prejudice and and so forth. And my constant was, was try to improve myself and try to make changes towards the acceptance of uh, uh, of my services, mm -hmm. uh, and not not keep on kicking me. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And I, th and I think the amazing thing, and speaking as maybe one who would have reacted differently, you kept your dedication, you kept your patriotry, uh, patriotism, you kept your eye on the prize. And you just you, you just said, well, I'm just going to keep working hard, and, and that in itself is commemorative, right? You know what happened was that like uh, uh, Benjamin L. Davis was the first black general in the army. Uh, his son, Lieutenant General uh, Davis, who was uh, in charge of the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, Willie William, and it was these people there that inspired me and to hang in there because uh, I know they had to go through the same thing I went through, or, or am I going through, uh, uh, and, and yet they're, they're, they were strong enough to hold in there and reach their goals or objectives. And, and that's, what, that's what inspired me to do. If I was to say you, one of the most 
positive things that have ever happened to you in the military as a result of you being in the military. Could you focus on that? Yes, uh, by, uh, by my benefits and entitlements, uh, such as uh, me and being able to get my education. Mm -hmm. uh, I got uh, my master's degree uh, through the military. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, and uh, my benefits and entitlements uh, through the military. My, my, uh, my brother came home from Vietnam to a very unappreciative country. When you were finally sent home from Vietnam, what was it like when you returned home? I didn't have no problem. I weighed 243 pounds. You gained weight in Vietnam? Uh, yeah. You're not the only person <laughs> I know that gained weight in Vietnam. <laughs> I'm going to, uh, to uh, I'm going to uh, end it now and uh, let you say to give any message you'd like or any way you'd like to salutate or end this, this and then I'm going to, how would you like to end? Well, I think uh, the best way to end it, end it is to, for the American people to be appreciative of a veteran. The price is eBay. And they tell you, give you all the statistics about those who died, and for everyone that you t they told you they're dying, they're not speaking about those who were wounded. And they take well, the World War II is over, career is over, over for you. There's a lot of veterans out there carrying the wound, and they will carry it to their grave. That's the price that they pay for the freedom that you enjoy. It's been my honor to really uh, to interview you on behalf of Burlington County College and behalf of the Armed Forces Heritage House and a grateful country. I want to shake your hand, Bobby, and see it's an honor my to pleasure. know you. It's an honor to work with you, and I consider you a true hero. My, my pleasure. I, I felt dynamic. I felt that, that you know I had that power uh, to alleviate their pain. Uh, to, to get them to settle down and to assure them you got it made. You understand me? You're going home. We're going to still be here. You know?